Nefia, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for today. I'm excited. I want to ask you right away because it is the beginning of the week. Now you're in Australia, so it is your your Tuesday morning. I'm Monday night. But one thing that I do a lot lately is I pick a word of the week. And I feel like knowing that you're all about mindset and manifestation, I feel like this is more your jam. So my question to you is, what is your word of the week? What do you want from this upcoming week? Oh, I love that. Hmm. What do we want from this week? Expansion, you know, I think. I was um, mm. in Pilates yesterday and it was so hard. There was like one point where she's like, okay, just point your knee out a little bit. And my legs were shaking. She's like, oh, you can't do it because your legs are shaking. I was like, yeah. And then I finished the class. I'm like, see you on Wednesday. <laughs> so what? just explain more, like what, what around expansion? I, you know, I think it's just putting yourself in situations that are going to cause you to expand and being open to seeing what happens. I actually just did a post yesterday actually on TikTok about how your dreams aren't as big as you think they are and we build them up Mm. in our heads and we create these excuses for ourselves and we're like oh well it's so big that's why it's so difficult for me to do in Mm. actual fact like they really aren't as big as as we make them out to be and when we can go through the strategy or we can align ourselves we can check our energy things flow and become so much easier so I'm leaning into this period of expansion knowing like yeah I have big dreams and I have big goals but they're not that big they're not impossible Mm -hmm. I follow this program I'm not sure if you're familiar with it it's called to be magnetic it's like kind of like a self-help manifestation program have you ever heard of that I've heard of it but I don't know the details the one of the biggest terms that she has trademark is expander so basically extremely similar to what you're saying is if you if you can find someone else that has done what you want, then obviously it's possible, you know? And that's the a very easy way towards manifestation based on her method of, okay, this is your dream. Okay, your dream is I want to move and live in Europe and just relocate. Okay, someone out there has done that before you. So go find them, see that it's possible, and then learn that it's possible for yourself. So so I guess my question to you is, what do you want to expand? Like, what areas do you want to expand in this week? Oh, everything. And um, so I recently passed my driving test and I've actually not been out since I passed my test because I'm like, I, I can't be in a car alone. Mm-hmm. But it's something like I, I've joined a car sharing program. There's literally like one downstairs in my building that lives in the garage in my building. So I'm like, I have no excuse not to do it. I'm also going through new levels in a poll and I've just launched, well, pre-launched something new in my business as well. What did you say? New levels in what? Pole, pole dancing. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I know you said the word pole, but I'm like, okay, maybe I misheard her because I have no reference or context of what that means. That's super cool. That is, this is why you're fit. Like that takes so much body strength. Yeah, it's a lot. So I was in beginner for two semesters and I just leveled up to intermediate prep and I was like, yeah, this is going to be no problems. I've been doing so well in beginner. It's so challenging. It's like a whole new set of muscles. So I go to studio time, which is where there's no teacher and you just kind of like practice the moves by yourself. Oh, cool. Very cool. How long have you been doing that? Since January. Oh, so it's new. Yeah, it's new, new. Was it difficult as soon as you started? Yeah, I was like so crap for the first, like, probably for the first semester. (laughs) And then I started going to not just the class that the teacher would teach, but I'd go to like two studio times in my own time as well. And then when Mm -hmm. I started doing that and like putting in more of the work on my own, like things progressed so quickly and it was Mm -hmm. very easy to to grade up after putting in those extra hours. So that's my intentions for this semester too. Very interesting. Yeah, I like that expansion. Okay, okay, I'm aligned. So at 14 years old, you were orphaned. I know you've told me the story before, but I want to just hear from that experience of what it means to be orphaned at 14 years old and what the family dynamics were at that time. So basically to be orphaned means to, you know, not have either of your parents at a young age. And I was actually adopted when I was three years old. Both my sister and I were adopted. And my mom, or my adoptive mom, was a single parent. So when she got ill and later passed away, that meant that we, you know, we literally had had no other family. We had my gran and in my mind, I'm like, oh, I, I guess we'll just live my, with my gran, my gran who's 86. And there's like no way that social services would place us with her. So it's weird because, you know, my mom was ill for such a long time that 
when someone's ill for so long, you just accept that as your way of being. You don't actually think like, oh, like one day she could just not be here. It's just like, oh, my mom's sick. That's just how it is. So yeah, it was, it was a really challenging time. And I think that it's something that I'm like still processing now. I think you don't have the full capacity to experience something like that when you're 14 years old and for your life to shift so dramatically. Like it wasn't just my mom passing away, is my mom passing away, my family situation changing. And then six months after that, actually my grand passed away. And then a year after that, my best friend at school passed away. So I was like, it was a lot from a very young age. And it definitely led to me becoming like hyper independent. Mm. So at 14, how old is your sister? My sister, she's a year and a half older than me. So yeah, you're two like 14, 15, 16 year old girls with absolutely no family. So what is it like? So do you go into the foster care system at that age? So typically you would go back into the foster care system, but we had a family friend who I told about the situation at the time and I I just called her because I didn't really know who to like talk to out of my friends about it. And I was like quite close with one of my friend's mom. And I called her and I told her what happened. And she said that she was like going to come around to her house and see us and make sure we were okay and stuff. And she was just like, don't worry about anything. And she actually moved into our house with her kids. Wow. And so did she have a partner? Did she like how many kids did she have? No, she didn't have a partner and she had two kids of her own. So one was like around our age and then one was like four. He was four at the time. Women are phenomenal, hey? Yeah. And I know with even in your business and coaching and everything you do, you're all about making sure women know how powerful they are. But even even women with bad mindsets and no interest in manifestation. My God, when we are put to the test, we step up, hey? Yeah, for sure. I feel like you grew up surrounded by a lot of women who took on more than they probably even thought they could ever handle. I mean, your your adoptive mom at three adopted both of you as a single mom. And then she passes. And then this other single woman who already has two kids of her own takes on both of you as well. <laughs> you were surrounded by very powerful women growing up it seems yeah definitely and even you know family friends of my adoptive mom they still continue to support and be there for us today I Mm -hmm. remember going through uni two of them were lecturers so I'd send them like my dissertation and uni projects and they'd help go through it so you know that expression that it takes a village it definitely does Mm -hmm. did you ever have any contact with your birth parents yeah so my birth mom reached out a little bit after my mom passed away she didn't know that my mom had passed away she'd been trying to get in contact with us for a while and we met up with her maybe a couple of years after my mom passed away and yeah I have a really good relationship with my birth mom like she's Mm -hmm. she's so funny like meeting someone after all that time and having like a lot of the same mannerisms and we have two two more brothers that live that lived with my birth mom as well. So it's like this whole other side of the family, very Nigerian. So my sister just got married last year in in Lisbon, actually. She had like a three-day wedding, like a Nigerian wedding, a white wedding, and a like family and friends wedding. And it was, it was just so fun to have like that side of the family there as well. Very exciting, very excited. Now, you say that in your late teens and early 20s, you were definitely known as a high achiever from the outside. But you say that you're always kind of waiting for a shoe to drop or something to go wrong. Why? Like, why did you feel that way? I think just because what I had experienced in in my earlier years and also at that time, I was experiencing anxiety and depression, but they're like not nearly as talked about or as much information as is available about them today. So I remember at the time being just like really overwhelmed and staying up to like, the middle of the night and this is before like TikTok and Instagram and cool things to be scrolling in the middle of the night I was just awake and I went yeah and I went to the doctors I'm like oh yeah I just need some like sleeping pills I've been trouble having trouble sleeping and then just like asking me to go through my situation and then it's like okay I think you might be experiencing depression I'm like depression no I'm just tired um Mm -hmm. so it it was was quite confronting for me and then it was something that I continued to experience, particularly anxiety is, is even something that I still experience now, although like not on that magnitude. But at that time, it was very all-encompassing and I put a lot of pressure on myself because I felt like 
success almost felt like a live or die situation. It was like, you have to be mm. successful. You have to do well at uni. You have to do this because like, you don't have anywhere else to go. Like if you have to drop mm. out of uni, like who are you going to live with? You don't have a family home to go back to. Like you have to make something of yourself. I resonate with that a lot. I have a lot of friends of mine who have awesome plan Bs. And also I know a lot of people just through social media and acquaintances where whatever they're doing right now, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. Like you have a great fallback plan. But I remember being in university as well and being surrounded by very, very wealthy people and just feeling that they did not have as much stress as I did. Were you surrounded by similar people? Yes and no. Like I, I grew up in a really, 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 really small town. So mm-hmm. my immediate circle of friends, I guess there was like a, a mix of the two, but they definitely had like strong, well, from my perception, maybe they didn't, from my perception, they had like strong family units. Mm. So what's, obviously it's, it's probably obvious where the anxiety and depression came from, but was it obvious to you? Because you seemed shocked when they said this is probably depression. Yeah, because I thought I was like holding things down. I was like, I've got this, I'm fine. And I guess this is just the impacts of of trauma is that you don't fully, it's difficult to explain how you process a situation, but essentially we had found out that my mom had passed away and it was like midnight on a school night. And then come 8 a.m., we were just like hopping on the school bus like nothing had happened, like going to school. And then I was like, we were actually pulled out of our classes by, um, they kind of have social services within the school. And then they did like a special assembly telling everybody basically when they'd taken us out of classes. And I was like, like, why? Like, we can just like carry on. Like, yeah. Did that trickle over into your 20s where you, you didn't allow yourself any time to process real emotion? For sure. And I think it's just, it wasn't something that I had really learned how to do either. Like, I I had no one who told me like it's okay to you know take a moment or take a beat because to everyone else like I was doing fine I was doing great like on the mm-hmm. outside I don't think people knew that I was actually having this like internal struggle that hyper independentness and desire to succeed and always being that high achiever I mean often underneath is a lot of pain just pushed down and really the fuel to continue to succeed is probably coming from that pain. Would you agree? Yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying because like, I mean, I'm hyper independent. I always try to succeed. But then all of a sudden, burnout happens and you're exhausted and you're you're staying up all night and you're wondering, but why? Like, I don't feel sad. Like, I'm not crying, but obviously there's some type of emotion that's causing that distress and not being able to relax. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I totally understand. And I think particularly as women that we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves and being seen to have it all together at the same time as trying to achieve it all. And I think that we're in an exciting time where especially with the rise of TikTok and people expressing things like, hey, this is what ADHD presents itself as in women, or it's okay to be vulnerable, or learning that burnout actually takes a really long time to recover from. And I think the more information that we have, it gives us kind of more more evidence to go off of that helps us frame our situations in a totally different light. Mm. Despite being so high achieving and successful, why did you always feel lost? You say that you did your undergrad and then you're about to do your master's and you basically were like, like, I, I'm miserable. I hate this. So why did you go do your master's? And again, why did you keep feeling lost? So initially, I really went to go do my master's because I didn't know what I was going to do after I graduated from my first degree. Mm. I graduated with a first. So I was like, obviously, I'm good at studying. I'm good at this. I know how to do this. I had my like communities and volunteer groups I was part of in uni. So I was like, okay, well, not that much would change if I just went back for another year and kind of extended this process of going to uni. So to me, it seemed like a fail safe. And it was something that I had like really never wanted to do. My sister went back to do a master's and I was like, good luck with that. I would never, I would never do a master's. And I'm like, see you later. I'm off to uni again. And I also felt like I could, I could get funding for it, which I did end up getting. So it didn't cost me extra to go back to uni and do another year. So yeah, that was the reason why I went, but soon into it, I realized that it just wasn't for me because despite being 
good at studying. It's not really enough if you're not passionate about what you're doing or you still have those underlying feelings. So I thought I would go back and then I wouldn't have this worry of like, what's going to happen next? Like, where are you going to live? Where are you going to go? I did still have those feelings and they were probably worse because I'm like, okay, after this, you really, you can't go back and do master's, master's. Like, what are you going to do? So it was an extremely stressful time for me. I also end up getting unfairly dismissed from a job during that time. So it was, there was just so much emotionally going on and I was trying really hard to get therapy. And we have a system in Scotland where we have three healthcare, but due to having three healthcare, those systems at that point were really stretched to the limits. And I know now it's even worse. So although I was going to doctors and I'm like, I really think I need to see someone, they're like, oh no, you're probably fine. Like just talk to some friends or something. Mm. What year was that? That was in 20, 2016. 2016, they're saying, you're fine, just go chat to some friends. Yeah. And this was also when I was struggling with chronic pain at that time as well. And they were like, oh, it's probably just like bad period pain. It's honestly just part of being a woman. So, Were you shocked when you heard that in the moment? Or in hindsight now, you're like, what? Like, how can you say that? Yeah, at the time I was like, this just doesn't feel very helpful. Like you're supposed to be helping and supporting me and I don't feel helped and supported right now, especially with both of those things was something that I was like continually going to doctors for. And it reaches a point where it's like, well, these are the people that, that know best. Maybe I am like making it to be like a bigger deal in my head or something like that. And it wasn't until I, I moved to Australia when I actually ended up getting diagnosed with endometriosis, which is what my chronic illness mm-hmm. was. And, and they were like, yeah, this is stage four endometriosis. This is actually really, really bad. And it could have been, you know, way less bad than it had gotten if people had actually taken the time to listen and support me when I knew that something was wrong. So Mm -hmm. I did kind of just get into this habit of not really listening to my intuition. Like my intuition said, you don't really need to be going back to uni. This isn't for you. I pushed past him. I went anyway. My intuition said, I really need to see someone. Like I feel like, you know, at that point, I know what depression, anxiety are. I'm like, this is not okay the way that I'm feeling. But I pushed past him like, well, you know, this is just it. I felt kind of defeated. And then with my chronic illness as well, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this is just what I have to deal with. And so mm-hmm. now having that relationship with my intuition and helping other women have that relationship with their intuition is is so important is because it literally can be like a matter of life or death. Uh, one of my close girlfriends back in university, she dealt with a lot of health problems and chronic pain and similar to you where she would go to doctors and they would misdiagnose her all the time. And she always felt that there was more to it. And she saw many, many natural paths and figuring out little and little and little by little. One of the things that she discovered, and I have a full episode on this with her discussing it, is how repressed emotions lead to physical pain and a lot of her chronic pain she realized that was she was harboring a lot of like old old trauma and once she finally released those emotions and that pain a lot of her actual physical pain went away obviously with endometriosis and and very serious illnesses sure they may be linked but it's obviously not the only cause but I found that so interesting and seeing and talking to you and learning like how many times in your life you didn't or didn't even have the time or opportunity to process pain. I'm not surprised that there's physical pain too, you know? Mm. So I found that very interesting with her. I'm curious, what made you want to move to Australia? The weather. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, like, I guess this is a big story. And I'm like, I just need to be warm. And you know what? I was coming to the, towards the end of my degree. I'm like, okay, we cannot go back into this situation again where I'm studying again. I also felt like in Scotland, our degrees are four years. And then I went back to do my master's. So it's five years in total. And I'm like, I actually don't think I have the capacity to actually go into a career after this because I've been studying for so hard for so long that I think I just need to give myself a break. And I did know a couple of people that not necessarily were my friends that had gone overseas Australia ended a year there and I'm like oh, this sounds like this could be cool and one of my friends was like I've been feeling the exact same way and I was like mm. let's do it this is it this is where we're going what did you do as your undergrad and your master's again so I did my undergrad in media and then I did my master's in digital marketing what was the plan just directly marketing digital marketing that types of stuff yeah because I had been doing internships in marketing and PR and I'm like yeah I could do this and I had my blog at that point I'd been well 
been okay. blogging now for 10 years, but at the time it was like something wow. I've been doing throughout my degree. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I thought so many times throughout my degree, I was so bored with like my program and my internships and whatnot. I was like, oh, I should start a blog, but I never did. I definitely put limiting beliefs and roadblocks of reasons why I couldn't. And then you look back and you think, why didn't I never start if that was something I was thinking about? So I'm glad that you were doing it, which is really cool. Obviously, it's a lot easier to start now with fantastic phones and social media. Back then, this was like pre-Instagram times. Yeah, it was the, the Wild West back then. I look back at some of the posts that I, I wrote when I first started. And I kind of leave them there because I'm like, well, this reminds me like how far I've come. It's, it's just funny. Like you really can start from wherever you're at. I know. I know. And there shouldn't be anything that stops you. So was the plan to just go to Australia for a year? Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to move there for a year and then probably come back. Where was your mindset at that time? Obviously, you're tired of what you're doing. You need a break. But your mindset still is giving the impression that you think a lot is possible for you and you're ready for change. So do you think your mindset was good? Uh, Yes and no, because I was still struggling with anxiety and depression. But Mm. yes, in terms of the possibility. And I was also part of a volunteer group at my university called The Voice of Reason. And also I worked with Who Cares Scotland and I was working with them to help change some legislation for care leavers. And in interacting with other people, I did realize that in many ways I was so lucky in my experience because there were kids in group homes that just had like no hope for their future or no support for what was possible for them. And I actually did have a lot of those things. So the the mindset that I had grown up with from my teachers, family, friends was always like you can you can go out there and do anything that's possible for you. Mm. You say a lot of your life living in Australia so far has been a huge spiritual journey. Why? I think because when I moved over here, number one, I had never intended to move over here by myself. And then three weeks before, my friend was like, yeah, I'm not yeah. coming anymore. Do you want to get into that? <laughs> Do you want to get into that one? Yeah. So Does that, does that still bug you to this day? No. At the time, I was, I was devastated. And, in, you know, I felt really heartbroken. I was really hurt, especially that it was like such a short amount of time before. But it actually worked out the best way it could have worked out. Like if it had happened a couple of months before, I think I still would have been like, okay, I could just not go and, you know, kind of talk myself out of it. But because it happened three weeks before, I'm like, okay, I've basically paid off my flights. I don't have, I've given up my apartment. I've prepared an amazing leaving party. I can't go back on these things now. So I was at the point where I kind of had to go, not from the like drive of like, I can't wait to go from Australia, but like I've burned my life here. So I have to leave now. And so Mm -hmm. the way that things happened was the way that things were supposed to happen. And the moment that I got off the plane, so initially I went to Asia for seven weeks and then I moved to Australia. The moment I got off the plane, it was, it was, it was incredible. I remember crying on the plane because I was like, what have I done? And I got off the plane and I'm in a taxi and I'm like looking out the window. There's like three people and a dog on a motorbike. And I'm like, this is amazing. And that kind of this is amazing feeling has just stayed with me of the the things that we get to experience and the magic that really is out there in life. You know, I'm moved to Melbourne thinking that, OK, I'm going to come to Australia and then I'm going to travel around the East Coast and live my best life for a year. And then I arrived here in Melbourne and I never left because I just like loved it so much. I'm living in one of the coldest cities in Australia when my plan mm. was like to live it up in the sunshine. And your plans can... It evolve and change so much and you have to be willing to to kind of float along with the tides and see where life is going to take you and I think Mm -hmm. that can be so scary it's like oh well I've had this plan for exactly how everything is supposed to be but if your intuition is telling you to do something different you have to kind of lean into that intuitive feeling and that intuitive knowing and because it's always it's always supported you I mean I'm sure you wish right from the get-go that you trusted your intuition more but when did you really start trusting yourself where you realized, okay, I know myself best. If this is what I want to do, I need to stop listening to everyone else and watching what everyone else is doing and just go for it. Like, where did you get that courage and finally start to trust your intuition? So during this year where I was prepping in back like seven months where I was prepping to go to Australia, I was like, I can't go with the way that I am feeling right now. And one of my uni lecturers had actually Mm. helped me get into therapy as well as one of my friends. 
because I'd been going to the doctor and I had kept being rebuffed and it gets to a point where you kind of develop this additional anxiety which is medical anxiety so I had anxiety about going to doctors being really vulnerable and then them being like no so one of my friends actually came with me to the doctors and I talked expressed how I was feeling they were just like we just don't have the resources to support you right now I think they offered me some like online course on depression and I was like this is not what I need right now and then my friend was just like this is not good enough she needs to see someone like yesterday and then within the next month I was in therapy and <laughs> it actually didn't work out because me and my therapist we just didn't see eye to eye I didn't feel like they were a supportive person at all but it was a catalyst that I needed to feel like I actually could change my situation that you know anxiety wasn't who I was in my entirety and so that was when I really began my spiritual journey healing journey and learned more about personal development and the law of attraction and manifesting things into your life so at the point when I was leaving to go to Australia my life had already changed in so many ways and I think it's important to say that because you can think oh well I'll just move country and like just forget about everything that's going on with myself you still have to do the internal work and everything that you're grappling with or dealing with at home is still going to come with you so knowing that I was like I want to make the most out of this experience Obviously, at that point, I didn't know I was going to be going alone. I still thought I was going to be going with my friend. But having done that pre-work, that meant by the time I was traveling by myself in, in Asia for seven weeks, that I was leaning more into trusting myself and going with the flow and saying yes to opportunities and seeing where things took me. Because I did, it was a time in my life where I really did have no responsibilities other than enjoying myself and having fun. I want to jump on a point that you just made that I really agree with. I see a lot of influencers and digital nomads and even just people who switch locations a lot. And I think that they think switching their location and moving all the time is going to solve all of their trauma and problems. And I don't think they realize that just because you change your location doesn't mean that everything within and all of your patterns and all of your limiting beliefs change. Do you see that sometimes? I think so. I think it just depends like where your your head is at going into these things. And I think, you know, it can be a catalyst for a lot of people, but you have to be willing to do the work when you get there and not just kind of like put it off to like, oh, like I agree. when I get back, when I get back, there might never be a going back. <laughs> yeah, I find... I find a lot of people seem to think that if they just change locations, move to a new city, move to a new country, that everything will get solved. And a lot of the times it's really, really deep within like your mindset, your limiting beliefs, your patterns all the time. But obviously, as you said, you worked on your mindset and your personal development way before you ever moved to Australia. So in Australia, even though it felt like a new beginning, a new start, you were already had the intention to make things better, not just, woo, new place, new, new, better weather. You, it seemed like you had some heavy intentions. Yeah, I did. And I think it's important to be intentional about what you want to create for your life. I think there is a huge difference between having a dream or a wish for something you would like to happen and it actually happening. And the differences in my mind are the commitment and the action you take towards making it happen. So to me, it was very important to get behind the action and the commitment piece because I didn't want to experience what I had been experiencing for the last however many years again. Like I didn't want it to be a repeat of that situation. I wanted to have taken something from that situation and I wanted to be coming out of the other side, not just like staying in the mix. I was just going to say, when I was doing my research and prepping for this episode, I was reading your articles that said the age old phrase of fake it till you make it, you don't agree with. What you like to say is don't fake it, embody it. So if you want to be a different person, you need to already start acting and being like that person. So that example, how did that apply to you? Basically, who were you? Who did you want to be? And like, what did you start to embody and change about yourself in order to become that person? The reason that I realized this was because in my third year of my first degree, I had won this scholarship slash internship to go work in San Diego for three months and everything was fully paid, flights covered, mm -hmm. everything. 
And when I had won that internship, despite going through like a really vigorous interview process from like a thousand people, a hundred, a hundred people were chosen to go on these internships. And despite getting through all of those in the first few like weeks of that experience, I felt like a massive imposter. I was like, all oh, these other people are so incredible are so amazing. And then they somehow also chosen me. And I was realizing it was because I was like, okay, I'm just going to you know, I did a lot of research around like, okay, this is the kind of things people say or how they act or what they're supposed to do. And I was separating myself from these people, even though I had been chosen to be one of these people. And I was still putting that separation. And I'm like realizing is because it's because I didn't like embody fully the person who I was. So moving to Australia, I knew that. And I've always been someone who's extroverted and outgoing. I think some things like just going on with my life kind of like push that down so I just wanted to like fully step into this expression of myself and the first year that I actually went back home well home (laughs) Scotland to visit one of my friends is like wow you're just like so so free so open so happy like it's like you're a different person I'm like it's not like I'm a different person like this is who I actually have always been this is just like me Mm -hmm. having had the chance to express it so I think that's something that people often discount about change or reinventing yourself is like okay I need to become this like totally new person actually you just need to highlight what elements of yourself you want to bring to the surface it's not like you've never experienced confidence before it's not like you've ever experienced feeling empowered before it's just maybe you've not had those things for a sustained time so I knew what things within myself I wanted to bring to the forefront and then I gave myself the permission to do it what were those qualities? Like what qualities did you love about yourself that you feel weren't being embodied as much? Because a lot of the times, as you said, you don't change who you are. You just remove all of the layers that are hiding who you truly are. I I used to put a lot of pressure on myself and I think I allowed myself just to not be perfect, to try things and maybe not go as expected. And there is nothing that will incubate you faster in that period than solo travel and just a while the situation's mm. coming up that you, you just have no idea you cannot be prepared for and and it just allowed me to to explore and to decide who I did want to show up as and there was no you know when you do move countries no one's saying like oh you used to be like this or you used to be like this this is just mm. this is who they've always known you as and and I, that's that's what happened for me it was like well this is this is who I am and there's nothing to say any different I don't have to be anxious and depressed and all of these things that are, are things I experience, but they're not the the wealth of me. They're something I experience, but they're not the entirety of me. And I'm not saying that now in my life, I don't have challenges because I absolutely do. But the way that I approach these challenges and situations and the way that I feel about them and the capacity that I have to deal with them is completely different. So wherever you are on your healing journey, your growth journey, your manifestation journey, I don't want you to have the misconception that you're going to get to a point where you're going to be healed and you're never going to have any challenges or situations. And that if you do have challenges or things go in inverted commas wrong, it's because you're going backwards. There isn't a backwards to go to. But the way that you deal with things is something that you do get to decide and you get to make that decision every day. And it's not always going to be perfect, but you know, as long as you are trying, then that's that's more than you can ever wish for. Hmm. So, so, so true. I want to ask you about your vibes method. What does V-I-B-E-S stand for? So the vibes method is my five-step manifestation method for aligned manifestation. And after moving to Australia, I really felt like I had become the manifestation queen. This is like before moving, I'd created my first Why? vision board. I, before moving, I'd created okay, my first yeah, vision yeah, board. Okay. And I took so many things off of that. So it's funny because the things that I would put in a vision board then and the things I'd put on now are so different. But I remember I'd put like an infinity <laughs> pool. Like I want to swim in my first infinity pool. I had put me graduating uni. I had like this Tiffany's necklace. I had me moving to Australia. I had me really developing a relationship with like health and fitness. And and I had I had experienced all of those things moving to Australia. I had experienced incredible opportunities. And even when I was in the space as travel influencing, travel blogging, I had managed to secure opportunities that people would say were not possible for someone with 10 times the following or the influence that I had. Really? So I really just had this strong sense of faith that I could make things happen. And so mm-hmm. moving into this kind of mindset, 
something that I had noticed was like, well, wait a minute, I have had this vision board from 2018 and actually none of the things on here have manifested. I thought I was the manifestation queen. Why is this happening? And what I mm. had realized was that I had been placing so much emphasis on the intentions of the things that I wanted to manifest without actually checking in with myself and seeing that these things I had put there were actually aligned with my values. So things like mm. buying a house or there were other things I had on there, like a certain number of followers on Instagram or Pinterest. And those weren't things I actually genuinely wanted or cared about for my life, but they were things that I thought that I should want. And I see this with a lot of my clients and students. It's like, okay, well, I know I'm supposed to do this or this is where I should be at, at this point in my life. So that's what I'm going to go ahead with. And the Vibes Method was really a response to that of encouraging people to actually check in with their values first so that they can manifest something that is aligned with where they want to go. Hmm. Okay, so that's V, values. So, And I love that because, I mean, I sell real estate and not everyone wants to buy a home, but in society, we have been told that for you to move up the ladder of success, one of those things is to own property, but not everyone wants that. So I'm glad that you gave that as a great example of, hmm, I wasn't achieving this because it's not even aligned with my values. And so if you want to, feel free to go through the rest of the acronym if you for your own example. Yeah. So the first step was embodying the vibe of your higher self, which encourages you to check in with your values mm -hmm. and make sure that the things, you know, that you are aligned with, what is actually important to you. When you know that, it becomes a lot easier to set intentions that are actually in alignment with where you mm -hmm. want to go. You can say, is this attention in alignment with this value? Is it in alignment with this value? And if it's not, then you know that it's time to go back to the drawing board and maybe shift a few things. So it's really important when setting intentions that they are intentions for you, not for someone else. And then once you've got super clear on those intentions, then we move into the final three steps, which is energetic blocks and boundaries. So this is where we mm. look at things that could hold you back from potentially achieving those intentions. Right? It's very easy in the first two stages to get like excited, like, oh, I know my values. I know who I am. I know what I want. And then comes like this cascade of all this stuff is like, no, you can't. No, you shouldn't. No, you don't. No, you, And it's just like all of those ongoing thoughts and, and patterns and behaviors. So it's peeling back those layers. And it's also looking at the boundaries that you have in your life. Because if you're giving all your time and your energy away to the things that don't serve you, then you don't have the time and the energy for the things that do and are actually moving you forward. Mm -hmm. And then the final two steps is balancing feminine and masculine energy, which looks at the way that we mm. take action. So masculine and feminine energy are not necessarily like a man has masculine energy, a woman has feminine energy. We all have these yeah, energy yeah. poles within us. And then finally is surrender, which is trusting the universe and also trusting yourself. Mm. This is so powerful. If you're open to it, can I pick something that I'm trying to manifest and you can walk me through yeah, the letter? Yeah, absolutely. Just to give the audience another example, because this is a really, really cool acronym and methodology. Okay. One of my biggest manifestations that I want to happen is to live in a Spanish-speaking country and to ideally sell real estate there. Like mm -hmm. keep my same career, but in a Spanish-speaking country. Okay. So how do we do the vibes method with this? Okay. So what would you say your values are? Uh, I guess values in general. Yeah, just your values in general, not specifically related okay. to this, just overall. Okay. Some values in general are definitely exploration and experiencing new challenges and cultures and languages. And then another another value, I don't know if this aligns, but definitely something in my values. Is, no, this wouldn't be a value. But I just like really want to live like closer to the ocean. And I also want a a little bit more work-life balance because I find mm. where I live now, even though I love my career, it's a little little too hustly for me. And I think I'm very ambitious, but the hustle is draining. So I don't know if that helps. It does help. I would say that the living close to the ocean actually comes under the umbrella of your exploration value. So we can have like a okay. wider theme and then the next. So exploration okay. and work-life balance. So it, your intention of moving to a Spanish-speaking country and starting your real estate business there, like it aligns with both of those values of the work-life yeah, balance. Yeah. And, and so something that can happen if our intentions are not entirely aligned with our values is that 
we will kind of sabotage them out of a means of actually fulfilling the value. So let's say that you were mm. like, you know, I want to hustle more. I want to put in more hours at work. I don't know anyone who's like, the value this is, but let's say that was the case. And then you're setting an intention like, oh, you know, I want to move to a Spanish speaking country and maybe work less. Like those are not. Yeah, they're not in all. alignment at all. And if you, you don't know that, you're like, why am I sabotaging this when this is what I actually want? And you think that is what you actually want. So mm-hmm. it's really okay. good to, to know that so that you can align those two things. And then when setting an intention around this, I would just be really tapping into the feeling of like, what is it going to be like when you live there? What is your mm-hmm. day going to look like? Really feeling like this is possible for you because when you you feel it within your body, your body doesn't know the difference between like this is now or this is not. You know, when you, you have a dream mm-hmm. and someone does something to annoy you in that dream and you wake up and you're like, I can't believe it. It mm. feels so real. And then you're like, oh, mm. it was just a dream. Like it's the exact same for when we're setting intentions. Like your body doesn't know the difference. And the more that you can get into the practice of feeling that, the easier it becomes to see like, well, this actually could be a reality. And although maybe you haven't, mm. I don't know whether you've lived in a Spanish speaking country before. I think you just visited a couple of, was it a couple of months ago that you went to? Yeah, I went to Costa Rica and I love yeah. it. And I'm learning Spanish now on my own. Or oh, sorry, not on my own, but I'm studying Spanish yeah. uh, multiple times a week. So, you know, those things are also contributing to like putting you in the mode of like, oh, yeah, so when I'm living in whichever country it is, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is how I'm going to be speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we look at energetic blocks and boundaries. So this is everything that's coming up for you around why it's not going to be possible. So an example of a boundary might be like, oh, it's got Spanish class today, but I just don't really feel like I can be bothered going. I'm going to put it off. And this is a way mm-hmm. that, you know, you're subtly sabotaging yourself from actually moving forward with it because you're like, well, if I don't know Spanish, then how am I going to move to the country? So you just have to be yeah, mindful. Every, every of... time I'm too busy and I, I put my Spanish mm-hmm. studying to the last thing, I am self-sabotaging a little bit. And the other thing that I think is so important is that when we can commit to something, so say something genuinely does come up and you can't make your Spanish class, maybe you just like write off that class entirely. But you can actually give yourself a smaller substitute, like, okay, you know what? I'm too at my limits to do this class today, but what I could do is I'm just going to do like a couple of minutes on Duolingo just so that I still yeah. get like my minutes or something in. Like when we make too many excuses for ourselves, we're like, oh, I don't really have time next week. I don't really have time this week. And then before you know it, you're not even on track with it at all. So it's just mm. like, Yes, giving yourself grace, but also just like doing micro actions as well. On days where I can't be bothered to go to poll, I'm like, right, I'm just going to go to studio time for 30 minutes. And then afterwards, I'm going to eat whatever I want for dinner. And then I get there and I'm like, I might as well just stay for an hour. I might as well just stay for another hour. Yeah, and then, you know, you're you already know there. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then we're moving into balancing your the feminine. Other block, though, yeah. I don't know if this is, if it all has to be energy blocks, but like mm-hmm. a legitimate block mm-hmm. is in my mind thinking about how challenging it's going to be to like restart your entire mm. business. So it's almost like, why am I going to keep building and building and building in here if I feel that if I go, I need to restart or trying to figure out like, is is moving to a Spanish speaking country and continue my career just the next step? Or is it really completely two separate things? Ideally, I hope it's just a level up. But the idea that it could be com- two completely separate things and restarting over is very daunting. And it's like, oh, why am I putting all this work in now if I'm just going to restart everything later? Mm, that's a good question. So what actions have you taken to overcome that fear? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. Nothing. What actions could Nothing. you take? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know is honestly one of my least favorite expressions. <laughs> Because I think I we always there's always something, right? It doesn't have to be perfect, but let's say just off the top of your head, first three things that come to your mind. What are like the first three things that come to your mind that you could do to help you overcome this? One one thing that I know I can do is um, start even connecting with real estate agents in other countries, at least to understand like what is the process there? Like how is selling real estate there compared to here? And then I know the other step is identifying if I want to switch brokerages in the future to open me up to say a more international brokerage. Okay. And last one. And then a third is, third is I'm just continue studying Spanish. Wow. See how quickly that went from, I don't know. (laughs) No, I know. (laughs) So Okay. So the energy. The stories that we tell ourselves. Oh, I know. I know. What's the masculine and feminine part of this? 
So it's balancing the way that you you take action. So one of the things that you mentioned was that you want to have more equilibrium in your work-life balance. So that's not something that you want to wait until you have moved to the Spanish-speaking country to do. That's something that you want to start practicing and getting into the flow of like now. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I am so drained. And when you link it all back to mindset of, I can get into that before we leave. But to finish this part off, what's S again? Surrendering. Yeah. Okay. So how do I surrender? How just do you surrender? Surrender. Just let just keep saying it to the universe and let it all happen. I think with surrender, it's if it doesn't like come to you, something that I really love is just taking 10 minutes to either meditate or do a breath work so you actually have space. And you know, from conversations that we've had and from the work that you do, you seem like you're someone who's always on the go, always super busy. So surrender is not automatically coming to you. It's probably because you don't give yourself the space and the time to actually consciously surrender. Surrender is a practice, something that we need to incorporate into our life. So 10 minutes at the end of the day, like communicating with your higher self and saying, how can I lean more into the surrender or universe support me in embracing more surrender in my life? And actually disconnecting from the the go 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 and doing something Mm. that maybe feels even more uncomfortable than the go 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 which is just relaxing and just being and just being present and seeing what comes up for you sometimes I find I have no trouble relaxing but it's not conscious enough relaxing it's very like I am brain dead and now I'm going to either mindlessly watch tv or mindlessly scroll Mm. and there's literally as if I just unplug but not in a recharge way it's more just like we're dead (laughs) like burnt out and then I let the time pass of that time of burnout and then when the time comes where it's like no I can't wait I can't let another hour pass before I have to go 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 again and it's like there was no time where it was just conscious relaxing you know what Mm -hmm. I mean if it seems big right now you know a couple of minutes three minutes, four minutes, just uh, here and there, just like, okay, I am totally dead. I'm just going to take two minutes just to do this like breathwork practices. You know, you can do breathwork practices in in just a minute and you'll be surprised the things that come up for you during that time. Maybe you will get ideas of specific people you should reach out to or a name will pop up and you're like, oh, I should like look into that further. Or you will give yourself Mm -hmm. grace in ways that you can even imagine. And I think it's important to know that the Vives method is not necessarily Okay, I need to do V and then I need to do I and then I need to do B and then I need to do E and then I need to S. It's a way of mm-hmm. living. It's a it's a way of of maintaining your life. Hmm. What are your top values? Like my when you think about your entire life. Yeah. Freedom, connection are two of my biggest values. Freedom, connection, and play. Everything that I do relates back to those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to do a little value check in. I know one of my biggest ones is peace. Especially Mm. with my clients. One thing that I've changed a lot lately is that if this client of mine, I don't care how much money this client is going to bring me, if this client, if I don't feel peace when I'm interacting with them, if it doesn't seem like easy and like even flowing, then I don't want any part of it anymore because it just brings way too much just like stress and anxiety and not even productive stress, just like this back in your head stress. So yeah. So mm-hmm. I need to do a value check-in for sure. That's so uh, important. Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of questions about mindset before we go. Obviously, and I've, I've seen that you have talked about toxic positivity on other podcasts and articles. Obviously, we are going to have bad days. Things are going to irritate us. I mean, one week of every month, we are irritated. And at least like just on high, like, mm, I might burst. How do you manage still to keep an overall positive mindset, even though maybe realistically you are having a shitty day and you're pissed off? Because, like, correct me if I'm wrong, I can still have a negative day and be pissed off, but I can still have an overall positive mindset. No? Absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone has challenging days. Everyone has off days. And we really limit ourselves when we put ourselves in this box where we say, well, I can only manifest what I want when I'm feeling like 100%, 100% of the time, right? It's not realistic for us to always feel this way. And actually what derails us 
is not the negative emotion. It's not the negative experience. It's the guilt and shame that we have for, oh no, like I'm experiencing a negative emotion or I'm, I'm running away with this experience. Like if you just like let that experience come up and be like, you know what, this isn't what I really want to feel right now, but I'm just going to like let it come up. I'm going to process these emotions and see where it takes me. That is going to move you so much further on. I had an experience just the other day where I can't remember, but I was just having like a super highly strung day. And then I went into my driving lesson. This is before I passed my test. And then it was because I already went into it like super anxious. It was such a bad lesson and so many things went wrong. And then at the end, I was walking back home, went to go to KFC and they didn't have what I wanted. And then I just stood outside and cried. And I was like, this is a lot. But I just like let myself experience it. I was like, I wasn't like, this is stupid that you're crying over chicken tenders. I was just like, okay, let's just have a moment. (laughs) And then after that, I just felt like so much better. I felt so much lighter. And I was just like, I really just needed to give myself to like shift whatever that was. And an expression that I always like to say is, this is a moment, not a lifetime. So Mm -hmm. that can go both ways. Like if you're having a a negative moment, if you're feeling down, like it's not going to last forever. And if you're having like an out of the world, crazy experience, like lock in this feeling, like really be present in this moment because you're not going to feel this way forever. And you deserve to experience this moment in its entirety. And that is something that I think helps to ground you. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so true. I love that one where, yeah, it's just a moment. (laughs) It's not everything. It's hard to remember that sometimes. I mean, that's really a lot of what this podcast is about. It's no matter, like you can go through anything and it doesn't mean this is the rest of your life. This is, doesn't mean this is what you're going to be feeling. You're not going to be struggling with this forever. This too shall pass. All of those cliche things. What are some of your main tips before we go around cultivating a mindset that's going to allow you to manifest everything that you want? Be compassionate towards yourself. Take responsibility mm. for the direction of your life and be bigger than your excuses. I think it's very easy to to want to take the easy way out because it feels easy in the moment, but you have to realize that that intuitive higher self experience may cause that short-term pain, but in the long run, it's moving you towards what you actually want, whereas something in the moment that might feel more comfortable Mm -hmm. is actually taking you, you further away from where you want to go. So I'll give you like an example, like let's say you want to put yourself forward at for a promotion at work or ask for a raise, but you're actually afraid to do that. You're afraid to put yourself out there. And in the short term, you save yourself that fear, that awkwardness, that uncomfortable conversation, but you don't get the raise. But if you put yourself in that uncomfortable position, yes, it's uncomfortable for that moment, but the long-term potential repercussions of doing that is going to serve you for the long run. So I really dislike this expression that your ego is not your amigo because your ego has like such an important role in your life your subconscious mind is like crucial to this life that you're living day to day Mm -hmm. but you do just have to kind of build a better relationship with your subconscious mind and say like okay talk to yourself lovingly be like I know that I'm afraid of this it's okay to be afraid it's okay to have these feelings but this is really important to me so I'm going to push through this fear for a moment and I'm going to do it anyway and just get on board with that. When you look back at everything you've been through, orphaned at 14, moving across the world, everything that you struggled with in life, chronic illness, anxiety, when you look back and now you look at your life now, where specifically have you seen the glow in yourself? I think I see the glow in myself every single day. I think tapping into that as a daily feeling not just something like oh I'm glowing when I manifest this or I'm glowing when my mindset is Mm. positive it's looking for the glow regardless what is going on in your life even if you have a day where you like cried in bed all day well you know what I'm glowing because I allowed myself to to express those emotions like I remember in my previous my previous life I remember like seven years ago I was actually judging how well I was doing in my life by how long it had been since I last cried. So if I was like, oh my goodness, I've cried every day this week. I'm like not doing very well. Whereas now I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it was since I last cried, but I know that it doesn't impact like how well I'm doing in my life or yeah. how I'm experiencing my life. It's just something that I experience. And I think it's really important to express those emotions. Sometimes I'm crying with happiness. Sometimes I'm crying with laughter mm-hmm. at my own jokes. You know, it's, it's, it's all relative. So 
I think it's really important to look for those moments on a daily basis, like not just the to-do list, but like, what did I get done today? What did I experience today? How do I feel today? And, and, and really celebrating yourself. One of my favorite things to do with my clients is, um, especially if it's like a group program or something, I'm like, okay, I'm going to like, well, this is like, I'm giving away my secrets now, but anyway, I'll put them into like a breakout room. So I won't tell them what they're doing until they get into the breakout room, they get into the breakout room. I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, so just take it in turns for a minute to brag about yourself. And they're like, no, (laughs) and they just, no one else says anything. It's just like a minute and you just have to like run off all the incredible things that you've done, how amazing you are. And at first people are like, well, like, I guess I did this. And then I'll like come in towards the end of the session. Like I did this and this is amazing. I feel like this. And it's just like, give yourself permission to see how extraordinary you are. Mm. Oh, I love that. Where can everyone find you when they want to connect with you after this episode? So you can check out my podcast, the Manifest Edit podcast. I am on Instagram, Afiasalto underscore. And you can check out my freebie library by heading to afiasalto.com forward slash freebie. and. By the time this episode comes out, there might be a little new something, something on there. I love that. Thank you so much for being here. I love talking about mindset and manifestation. So yeah, there's always a powerful conversation because I mean, lately I feel like my mindset is definitely faltering a little bit and I know I needed this conversation to give me a little bit more of a pep and a reminder that I mean, you you are the creator of your reality. If you want to have a more manifesting life, then do something about it. Not dwell and wallow in the stuff that's going wrong. And uh, you remind me that I need to uh, check in with this burnout and remind me of my values. So again, thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. 